Welcome to GW Hospital HealthCast. I'm Dr. Mike Smith. Our topic today is Epilepsy 101, what newly diagnosed patients need to know. My guest is Dr. Mohamed Kobesi. He is a member of the medical staff and director of the Epilepsy Center at the George Washington University Hospital. Dr. Kobesi, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you. So why don't we go ahead and first start and talk about what is the latest research show in and what might be some of the causes of epilepsy? Epilepsy, by definition, is the propensity or the susceptibility to have spontaneous um, seizures that are unprovoked, okay? So a single seizure may occur in up to 10% of the population. One of every 10 people that we know may experience a seizure in their lifetime. But the susceptibility to have recurrent, unprovoked seizures is what constitutes epilepsy, which is 1% of the population. Seizures in general can be either generalized or focal, uh, if we want to broadly categorize them. Focal seizures start in one area of the brain and then spread like, uh, 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 for example, they can start in the area that is responsible for movement and spread to other areas that are responsible for cognition and awareness. Uh, uh, or they can start in the area that is important for vision or hearing, etc. Uh, generalized seizures, they appear to involve widely distributed networks in both sides of the brain at the same time. And uh, what seizures are is just abnormal synchronized electric discharge that affects big neuronal population, meaning big number of cells in, in the brain. So anything that disrupts the brain potentially may produce seizures. Examples are numerous, obviously. Uh, 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 trauma can cause seizures. Uh, blood itself is very irritating to the brain cells and may cause them to fire abnormally, which is a seizure. Um, abnormal blood vessels, stroke, uh, brain tumors, abscess, other kinds of infection like meningitis, encephalitis, anything that irritates the outer layer of the brain, which is the cerebral cortex, can cause seizures. But still, despite all this knowledge, there is still almost half of the patients who have epilepsy. We do not know of any specific cause for their seizures. Okay. So in some of those, so what that latest research is finding then in some people, sounds like they're born with it, the, the nerve highways, those, those, you know, how one brain cell connects to another and makes these neural or brain cell connections. In some people, it's not quite organized or structured the way it should be, and that might be a cause of epilepsy in some people. Is that, is that correct in saying that? This is correct. Uh, to explain further, this abnormal connectivity between brain cells may occur only in a, in a small region of the brain. And uh, uh, that's enough to produce abnormal electrical activity, which in turn spreads like fire in the woods to involve other brain regions, resulting in the clinical manifestation of the seizure. But uh, the description about abnormal connectivity between brain cells uh, uh, is, uh, is, a is an accurate one. How do we actually, so going back to the definition um, of epilepsy, What's, what's the formal definition of it? It's not just one seizure, because that might happen throughout somebody's life once or twice, but what's the real, true definition of epilepsy? The definition of epilepsy has uh, slightly changed over time. Uh, strictly speaking, like you mentioned, seizure is an abnormal electrical discharge or electrical activity in the brain, but epilepsy refers for recurrent, unprovoked seizures. The practical definition that clinicians used is two or more unprovoked seizures that are more than 24 hours apart. How do we treat uh, the, the seizure disorders or the epilepsy? Or what's the current um, treatment regimen in most cases? Um, in the last two decades, there has, has been a plethora of newer generation anti-seizure medications. Uh, in the 20th century, for the majority of the 20th century, the world had only two and later three medications to, to treat seizures. Now we have close to 26 or 27. So we are in good shape in terms of anti-seizure medications these days. When you diagnose a patient with epilepsy, someone who has had two or more unprovoked seizures, uh, then you start with pre prescribing an anti-seizure medication. Uh, anti-seizure medications can reliably and uh, uh, 
continuously control seizures in up to two-thirds of all newly diagnosed patients with epilepsy, which is good. The remaining okay. one-third, we call them medically intractable or pharmacoresistant. These are the ones uh, who continue to have seizures despite treatment with one medication. What you uh, normally do in such individuals whose seizures are not fully controlled by medications is you try to add another drug, switch to a different drug regimen, or if they prove to be uh, completely not responding to two or more medications at good trials, you may need to evaluate them for possible epilepsy surgery. That means if you can tell with accuracy where the seizure focus is, you want to test if it's safe to remove it surgically. In certain individuals, okay. epilepsy surgery can promise up to 80% chances of seizure freedom when continued medical therapy will not offer more than 5% chance of seizure freedom down the road. So in, in your experience in treating patients with epilepsy, Dr. Kobesi, what, what kind of effect does the diagnosis have um, the disease itself have on people and even the treatment, you know, in terms of like their career, you know, cognition, relationships, what, what have you experienced? Uh, we have seen the whole spectrum. Uh, a lot of people are uh, alarmed, but shortly thereafter reassured that their kinds of seizures uh, are the ones that tend to respond to medications successfully and that seizures, if controlled, should not affect their life at the social or psychological or cognitive levels, and they uh, uh, tend to accept the diagnosis and be adherent with their anti-seizure medications and follow up uh, uh, on time, and a lot of them have fine uh, uh, time with, uh, do not have a major difficulty accepting the diagnosis. Okay. On the other hand, there is a lot of other people who continue to adhere to stigma related to epilepsy. The moment they hear the word epilepsy, they think perhaps spirits or craziness or something that is uh, completely uh, untreatable, and it takes time to educate these individuals that this is not the case. Uh, so uh, in some individuals in big cities with, uh, with good uh, public transportation system, if you tell them that they need to refrain from driving, uh, until a sizable period of time elapses with no seizures while on treatment, be it three months or six months or uh, uh, 12 months, depending on where you live, uh, they get completely stressed out because their lifestyle uh, may, uh, may necessitate driving on a regular right. basis. In others, they say, fine, we can use the public transportation, we can wait a year with no driving, and they accept it kind of with, without a, a big deal. So we see the whole uh, spectrum in terms of the impact of the, uh, uh, of the diagnosis and what it entails uh, on the patients. Okay. So it, in summary then, Dr. Kobesi, is there something you would like people to know about epilepsy? I would like people to know that epilepsy is very, very common. It affects one of every hundred people that we know. And epilepsy is completely treatable in two-thirds of people. And even in the remaining third, we continue to uh, uh, increase the uh, uh, utilization of epilepsy surgery and electrical stimulation and even diet therapies in order to minimize the impact of epilepsy on people's lives. I would like people to know that epilepsy does not prevent people from being creative and leaders. And uh, there are major figures in history who had epilepsy, including some great authors and novelists like uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, possibly Vincent van Gogh, the great painter, also had it. Great Alexander had epileptic fits as well, among numerous, numerous others. So it does not prevent you from being creative. And uh, uh, in the majority of cases, it should not impact your life okay. uh, uh, severely. That was a very nice summary, Dr. Kabasi. I like the way you said that. And I want to thank you for the work that you're doing and also thank you for coming on the show today. You're listening to GW Hospital HealthCast with the George Washington University Hospital. For more information, you can go to gwhospital.com. That's gwhospital.com. Physicians are independent practitioners who are not employees or agents of the George Washington University Hospital.
The hospital should not be liable for actions or treatments provided by physicians. This is Dr. Michael Smith. Thanks for listening.